Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here with the help of Craig today to give you my definitive review of the brand new Sigma 90mm f2.8 DG DN. And this is for mirrorless cameras, both Sony full frame and then also for Leica L. I'm actually reviewing the uh, Sony FE version here today. So this lens is an interesting addition to this lineup that Sigma calls their I-Series. And we have seen a pattern start to emerge where there are actually two tiers in the I-Series. The first lens that we saw was a 45 millimeter f2.8, very, very compact, beautiful build. Optically, it was a mixed bag for me. That was followed up, however, with uh, lenses that were stronger. And, and so later on, we saw the 24 millimeter f3.5, which was a very strong lens optically. And then this 90 millimeter f2.8, which is an interesting lens for some reasons I'm about to detail. There's also a secondary tier that is a little bit larger in physical size. This 90 millimeter lens, if I take off the lens hood, is a really compact lens, as are all of the first tier of lenses. The second tier are a little bit larger, but they have larger maximum aperture and are arguably a little bit more professional grade because of it. And those include the 24 millimeter F2 that I reviewed last week. Check out that if you missed that. And then also the 35 millimeter and 65 millimeter F2 lenses. All three of those really excellent lenses optically that I personally really liked each one of them. First of all though, a word from our sponsor today. Today's episode is brought to you by the DreamBot L10, a next generation cleaning robot. We've been using the popular brands of robot vacuums for years, but the DreamBot L10 is the first one we've used that actually delivers on the promise of effortless cleaning. The L10 uses LiDAR laser navigation and 3D mapping to actually create an accurate model of the room or rooms to be cleaned. You can see that 3D rendering through the app and then choose how you want the area cleaned, including the ability to designate no-go zones. You can also set up detailed cleaning schedules, including start times and power levels. The 4000 Pascal suction is powerful enough for deep cleaning even on carpet, and you can simultaneously do both wet and dry cleaning of hard surfaces. We've noticed that the L10 is noticeably quieter in operation than our old Roomba. The 5200 mAh battery gives us up to 150 minutes of working time, enough to clean 2,690 square feet, about 250 square meters, or mop 2,152 square feet. Most importantly, however, is the fact that the DreamBot L10 actually delivers. Everything is logical and well-designed, from attaching the mop water tank to emptying the 570 milliliter dustbin. Obstacle avoidance is noticeably better than previous models I've used, and I rarely hear it bump into anything, even Loki the cat. If you're ready for next-level robotic cleaning, check out the DreamBot L10 at this link. So I see that the 90 millimeter is a really addi uh, interesting addition, and it's for this reason. Uh, I have noted that there have been on Sony, we've been really fortunate to have a number of really excellent uh, compact lenses that are you know, both strong optically, but also very compact at the same time. The limit on that, of course, has been any kind of really telephoto options. And so the closest that I have to this lens as a comparative is the Samyang uh, 75 millimeter f1.8 autofocus lens, which is a great lens. I really, really love it, but you know, nothing above that. And so if you wanted a little bit longer of framing, um, you just you really haven't had any options in these really compact type lenses and so i'm really intrigued by the 90 millimeter for that reason this is a great focal length uh, for a lot of reasons and a lot of applications it's a it's a nice portrait lens it's a nice lens if you want a little bit more compression and combined with a, a very usable maximum magnification it's a nice lens for blurring out backgrounds and getting close no macro lens i don't want to oversell that aspect but a very interesting lens for a variety of things I also think it's an interesting uh, focal length when you put it on to APS-C cameras, which certainly its size and weight makes it a natural fit for, where you have 135 millimeter angle of view with a 1.5 times crop factor. Obviously 135 millimeters is a very popular focal length for a reason. Now there are both pros and cons when you start to get into a longer focal length, and so it's not gonna be as natural a you know one lens solution. So very likely if you're considering this lens, it's gonna be a lens that you're adding to other lenses, but we'll detail a little bit of the how and the why as we move forward. 
One other final observation that I will make is that I was, the first thing I was reminded of is that when I was first coming on to Sony APS-C, I tried out some of the earliest Sigma D in lenses and included in those was a 60 millimeter f2.8, which of course, when you apply the 1.5 times crop factor is a 90 millimeter, you know, f2.8, or depending on how you look at it, you know, smaller. Um, f2.8 for light gathering, you know, depth of field a little bit smaller than that. That's a whole other complication that I won't dive into today. But that lens was really, really great optically. It was this very small, very compact lens, but it gave you a really interesting angle of view and was a great addition to some of those early DN lenses. They had their limitations, but now we've got a lens that has none of those limitations and is going to be very appealing at its 639 US dollar price tag. So we'll start by taking a look at the build and the handling. These i-series lenses are beautifully made. We'll explore why I say that as we dive in and look a little bit closer. So we'll take a closer look hands-on here. And so first of all, you can see even mounted on an APS-C body that I have just to kind of model the lens here. You can see that this truly is a very compact lens. And on that note, if you want to shoot it on APS-C, it'll give you a nice basically 135 millimeter equivalent angle of view. And obviously that's going to be a very attractive focal length as well. Overall, the lens is 64 millimeters in diameter, giving us a filter size of 55 millimeters here. And it is right under 62 millimeters in overall length. And so very, very compact. And it weighs in at a little under 300 grams, 295 grams. And so this is a lens, obviously, you're going to be able to pack along and not really notice the weight. No problems with that at all. We have nine rounded aperture blades inside. And so it retains a fairly circular shape when it is stopped down. Like other lenses in the I-Series, we have got an aperture ring here that has one-third stop uh, detents. You cannot uh, de-click it. However, you can switch it into the auto mode here. And if you want to control aperture from within the camera, we also have an AF-MF switch. In this case, it is the traditional horizontal position and not the lateral that we see in some of them. I actually prefer the lateral position just because it fits a little bit better. Here, it's a little bit of a tight squeeze with the aperture ring. And so I do prefer that mounted, you know, where the switch operates in this position or this rotation rather than side by side. One thing that is a nice touch here is that when you're in AF mode, it will show white. And when you're in uh, MF mode, it will show black there. Speaking of a manual focus, this is another very nicely executed uh, manual aperture ring. And so it has a really, really nice degree of damping. Everything is all of metal here. And so it feels really, really nice in operation. The, uh, you know, just the attention to detail on the build of these lenses is really, really exceptional and uh, it makes them a joy to use. Now, our minimum of focus distance here is 50 centimeters, which is not incredibly close, but at the same time, it's a fairly long focal length. And so that gives you a reasonable one to five magnification ratio or about 0 0.20 times, which is certainly very useful. Now, like other lenses in the eye series, you have the option of using a traditional pinch style cap. Uh, which I recommend when the lens hood is in place, which we'll talk about in just a moment. There's also the option to use this included magnetic cap. And so it can be a little bit quicker if you're just using the bare lens. It's a nice way of taking it on and off. Um, but as noted, if you have the lens hood in place, and on that note, the lens hood is fairly deep because it's a longer focal length. But again, it's very, very nicely made, all metal, nice ribbed pattern that uh, matches what's going on with the lens itself. But as noted, if you're using the uh, magnetic cap, because the lens hood is deep and because it fits pretty uh, flushly in there, there is not much opportunity to get it loose. And I had to put a fingernail on there and try to break it loose. Not convenient at all. Much more convenient to use a traditional pinch style cap where you can pinch in the center and remove or insert it that way. Now, as far as weather sealing goes, we have a gasket here at the lens mount, which is, of course is always welcome, but to my knowledge, there is no internal seals inside. And so we have got kind of the bare minimum, but everything else here is really beautifully executed. It's a very nicely made lens. So as you can see, a lot of great stuff here. I, I really think that these lenses are a, a tactile treat. They really do have a very premium feel to them. And, and so, you know, if you're kind of questioning the price tag, this is, a, this is a serious lens. It just happens to be a very compact lens at the same time. 
Beyond that, we see that Sigma has continued to refine the autofocus performance that also leaves this lens as a very usable one. Let's detail that for a moment right now. The 90mm f2.8 i-series lens has, like most of Sigma's recent releases on, you know, Sony, Leica, it has a stepping motor. And it, my experience has been fairly consistent with these lenses that the stepping motor is quiet, it is smooth, and it is quite fast in operation. Obviously, with some variability from lens to lens, some configurations are more challenging than others. In this case, you have got a relatively small maximum aperture. And so f2.8 for prime is not huge, so it doesn't put as much strain on an autofocus system. And byproduct of that is that I find that it works just fine. Um, it works fine for doing my standard kind of focus pulls. And so you can see that the transition between one subject to another is smooth, it's quiet in operation, and there is a nice quick uh, transition without any kind of hunting or settling. However, there were a few situations that I saw in taking stills where I got some false positives on autofocus, which surprised me, particularly when I had my Alpha 1 set on eye detect and I was shooting, um, I had it set on, or so Animal AF. And so I was taking pictures of Loki, you know, just kind of moving around as I like to do. And I found that some of these were consistently front focused. And so obviously, rather than grabbing the eye, it grabbed something in the foreground and in quickly taking the shot, didn't quite nail it. That's fairly rare in my experience these days. And so maybe there are a few places where there could be a little bit of maybe improvements to firmware to make sure that that accuracy is improved a little bit further. That being said though, for most of my shots, I got very good focus accuracy and I have no complaints about them. And also in when it comes to like, for example, tracking my face, uh, when it comes for autofocus, I felt like there was a fairly good job being accomplished, but again, maybe not quite as sticky as the best lenses are in terms of keeping that eye consistently in focus. At the same time, however, because uh, 90 millimeters is quite a useful video lens for this kind of segment. I've actually used this for a number of my segments kind of secretly over the last, you know, three weeks that I've had the lens before pre-release. And so as a byproduct of that, using it and the 24 millimeter F2 side by side, I have found it to be a really good, um, you know, lens for this kind of like static shot. And it's done a good job of tracking my face without any kind of pulsing or losing it. So, you know, it really kind of depends on the application. Overall, I am, I'm happy with the autofocus. I do think that maybe a firmware update might give it just that little bit extra of edge of performance. But at the end of the day, I mean, we're just light years ahead of where we used to be with autofocus on many lenses like this. So I find it hard to complain because this is a lens that actually performs quite well in most all focus situations. So we're going to check in with Craig for a couple of minutes and uh, kind of pick his brain for his experiences using this lens for video as well as checking out some of the footage that he was able to capture with it. So I'm here with Craig to get his take on how the 90 millimeter performed for video purposes. So Craig, give me kind of a, a big picture. How did you like using this lens for video capture? So overall, really nice. Uh, as we discussed with the uh, 23 millimeter um, build quality is incredible. Um, image quality is really good as well. Um, so overall, it's I found it to be a really good lens. There's some differences because um, I was playing around with some cinematic lenses, so I was noticing some things in specific for video that are that are. Uh, a little bit different. For example, just the teeth on the focus ring, they're a lot less than the cinematic. So to, okay. to come back to this was a little bit different and uh, there's an adjustment to be made there. But I mean, this isn't obviously a cinematic lens. This is, this is for photo. And so for, for all intents and purposes, it's a great lens. Yeah. Yeah. I've kind of felt like they've actually borrowed some design aesthetics from cine lenses, mm -hmm. particularly the aperture ring being having that raised teeth in there. It almost yeah. looks like it's designed for gearing. However, as you're probably saying, I don't know that the teeth ratio is quite right for an actual gearing. Although mm -hmm. with uh, a lot of times, if you're just clamping something down, it would be just fine for, for moving that. But again, yeah. the fact that you can't de-click this aperture means that it's not really designed for that. For video, you're gonna be doing aperture racking mm -hmm. and it's not really designed for that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's a design aesthetic, less maybe of a practical you know, application for that. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about this focal length in general. Now you're shooting on an A6400, yes. which means that with the 1.5 crop factor, this is behaving more like a 135 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously that is a popular focal length, but it's a more 
it's a less flexible, more specific one. So tell me about that. How is that for your applications? Yeah, so it's it's a bit of a balance. I mean, sometimes it feels like you're just way too far in that you can't handle it and you can't kind of settle it down and, and get a nice uh, bit of video out of it. For example, whenever we went hiking the other day, I was only able to get honestly two usable shots from okay. it just because it's it's so bouncy now of course the body that i'm using doesn't have image stabilization so that's taking a, yeah. a bit away from me but if you if you don't have image stabilization you need to be aware it's of that yeah. because those handheld shots are are very difficult you feel like you're way too far in so uh today earlier today i set it down on a tripod and i felt way more comfortable with it it was it was much more in its element sitting on a tripod stabilized down and uh, I was able to get some good shots with it, you know, tracking. I had some Canada geese coming in on the water and mm -hmm. I was able to track them and, and it felt really nice. And then even on a tripod, sometimes you almost, whenever you're tracking, if you're tr tracking birds or something very far away, for example, athletics or something, then sometimes you almost feel like you want a little bit more in. Yeah. But overall, it's, it's kind of that nice hybrid in between. Uh, you can also get some really nice landscape shots. Uh, if you're, for example, shooting islands or, yeah. or across a river, then sometimes a the wide is just too wide and you want to punch and you want to get the details. No, I, I actually look at this lens as being less useful even on a gimbal because a lot of times on a gimbal, if you're you're moving with that, it's actually too tight a framing yeah. for gimbal work. So it really, mm -hmm. to, in my mind, is more of a tripod kind of lens. We've already used this a bit, uh, tried it out some at the church as a good um, recording type lens. Yes. And from, if you're working at a distance, I would say from 50 to 75 feet. So let's say somewhere in the, you know, the 15 to 25 meter range. Mm -hmm. uh, that's it's a good focal length for capturing a speaker, and um, and so I, I see that as being an application. Maybe even for churches, yeah. if they're shooting just kind of like a static shot, mm -hmm. either from some fixed video positions or from a, a media booth. This mm -hmm. could be a good primary uh, focal length for that. You could augment with with wider shots. Absolutely, I really else. like the framing that it's been giving us as far as it's kind of that medium close up, just head to hip. Yes. And so I think in our, uh, the, the current auditorium we're in, we're working at about a 15 meter dif distance with that. And yeah, I've really liked it. I've mm -hmm. played with 75 millimeters before. Uh, I actually like this better. It, yeah. or just that extra 15 millimeters gives a little bit tighter framing and it makes me feel like I don't need to go back and then crop the footage later, which is useful. Mm -hmm. And obviously if you're streaming, you may not have that opportunity to do, do cropping. Yes. And so you, I, I find that to be a, a nice application for that. Mm -hmm. And so um, end of the day, this is a video lens that's useful as long as you understand what you're getting into yeah exactly yes. and it's probably not going to be your only lens for video you really need to nope. augment this with something wider so absolutely all right thanks mm -hmm. so obviously there are a lot of positive things to this point but as always kind of you know what makes or break a lens often tends to be its actual image quality performance how good of a lens is it it's not an inexpensive lens in the kind of bargain sense it's kind of a mid-price lens so does it live up to that price tag optically i think it does let me demonstrate to you why so first of all, we can see that as has been a trend with some recent uh, Sigma telephotos, short telephotos like the 85 millimeter f1.4, there's some significant pincushion distortion that is here. Um, and so, you know, vignette is not terrible, but this distortion is fairly strong, requiring a minus 11 to correct for that distortion. It's fairly linear, so the correction is pretty decent. And then when it comes to the vignette, it was a plus 48, so somewhere between one and a half and one and three quarters stops. Nothing too significant there, no big problem. Now obviously we have a nice degree of magnification, but here I wanted to just kind of check out what we're doing in terms of fringing and use that as a, an example here. And so you can see a little bit of purple fringing before the plane of focus, a little bit of green afterward, but it's pretty mild. And you can see that there's maybe a little bit of spherical aberration that you know keeps the contrast from being like macro sharp. But at the same time, that's a really high degree of magnification and nothing too uh, difficult there in terms of the uh, fringing and likewise here you know highly reflective surfaces and uh, you know light trapped in there and so you can see that again fringing doesn't look too bad here at all and you can see it's a, you know obviously a visually interesting image uh, that comes off of this lens likewise if we take a look here along the edge of the frame we see little evidence of uh, lateral chromatic aberrations no real uh, fringing on either side of the black and white transitions here so uh, that kind of chromatic aberration is also quite well controlled 
So here's a look at the test chart. This is wide open f2.8 with a 50 megapixel Sony Alpha 1 and magnified here at 200%. Let's take a look here in the middle and we can see that we have good resolution, very good contrast. You know, there's lots of detail there you can see that's being rendered. If we move off towards the mid frame, again, it looks really excellent here. Lots of detail, excellent contrast, you know, moving down to this area looks excellent. And then if we pop down into the corner, uh, we can and see that right out to the edge of the frame we have very good looking resolution and contrast and likewise if we move off towards the other side of the frame we can see that we have good centering here and a good performance as we look up at the various corners here everything here is looking really really good so a very strong wide open performance even on a 50 megapixel sensor Going out into the real world for a moment here at f2.8, we can see that at 100% magnification, plenty of skin textures, good uh, information that is there. Now, if we stop down from f2.8 to f4, we do see an improvement. You can see that there's starting to be some war pattern developing here, and that just shows that our resolution and contrast has gotten really, really strong. And so that's an excellent mid our center of the frame performance. And then here we can see in the mid frame, again, contrast has just picked right up and it looks fantastic here and right down into the corner we've got great detail and contrast there everything looks really excellent here moving on to f5.6 shows a bump even further in contrast to truly excellent levels um, this is a very strong performance so real world in the f5.6 range this at 100 percent magnification and you can see all across this door and the stone surrounding it that our detail is just really, really excellent. All of these textures are being rendered really well, and you can see that that detail just goes right into the edge of the frame. There's no drop off or softness in the corners. This is an extremely sharp little lens. Now, if we compare F11, we can see F11. We're already starting to have some diffraction and some softening due to that, but minimum aperture is F22, and you can see in this case, it is really soft by comparison. Certainly not worth shooting at unless you know, absolutely necessary. Now our maximum magnification here is about 0.20 times, which is certainly a useful figure. You can see the effect of that pincushion distortion here on our bill. As we can see looking towards the center of the frame, it's kind of similar to what we saw in that opening shot of the kind of nail head that, you know, there's very good magnification, good contrast overall, but just a little bit of softening if you get kind of off the sweet spot at all. And so you get just a little bit of some, you know, haze on the textures. Overall, not a bad performance here. And for example, here a real world, it shows to me that's, that's a really nice, useful amount of magnification there. And you can see that it's not macro sharp here at minimum focus distance, but, you know, viewed at a global level, it's still a nice sharp image that obviously has a tremendous amount of defocus potential because of the longer focal length. Here's another look at, you know, up close, and then you can see a, a nice creamy background kind of drop off there. And so this kind of image obviously works really well for a little lens like this. Similarly here, I think, number one, that the subject looks really, really great here, nice and crisp. And then our transition to defocus also looks quite nice as well. Another uh, shot here. And you can see that our detail on the subject really looks nice. And then our fall off to a defocus, you know, it's, it's a lot of yellow, obviously, but we can see no real hard edges. The bokeh quality is, is really, I think, quite good here. Now, here's a look if you have obviously like bright lights as a part of the background. And so definitely we have some geometric deformation as you get towards the edge of the frame, that kind of cat eye effect, not really unusual, but certainly present here. And, uh, but you know, the bokeh circles are, you know, nice and clean looking. I don't see anything too distracting here. There is a little bit of inner lining there, but, you know, overall it looks quite nice. Here's another image that really kind of shows, really shows off nicely the fall off to defocus. And so obviously our focus here and looks nice and crisp and detailed there. And then you can see that the fall off looks, to, in my eye, looks quite good here. Now we're going to finish off by looking at a few uh, kind of flare type images. And so this lens, it creates actually some fairly artful effects if the uh, sun starts to enter the frame. So we can see here that 
you know, we've got some defocused area in the foreground and just a little bit of a veiling type effect, but in quite an artful kind of way. With a little bit of recomposition, you can see that I've got a little bit of a ghosting artifact here, but I've, you know, I've improved contrast. So you can see from this little video clip the various artifacts as we kind of pan up and down. And so certainly there are a little bit of aberrations due to flare there, but in my eye they tend to be somewhat artful if they are used properly. Overall, a nice optical performance from this little lens. So at the end of the day, this is a lens I think is an intriguing lens for the right photographer. Uh, if you have maybe some other uh, more wide angle lenses and you're interested in having a bit of a longer focal length along, you know, very often to get f2.8 at this focal length, you're relying on, you know, either a macro lens or something like a 70 to 200 millimeter. Either way, you're at a completely different size point as this lens. And so I'm intrigued by it just as a bring along, you know, it's lightweight enough to bring along as an option in a kit when maybe you want a portrait option, a little bit longer, a focal length. And obviously it's going to be attractive either on full frame or APS-C for that purpose. And so I see a lot of value to it then. And as from the discussion with Craig, I do think that this is an intriguing lens. If you're shooting in an auditorium and you want just a video lens to capture a speaker, the framing works out quite well in a lot of you know standard size auditoriums uh, for that purpose. And of course with Sony having the option to maybe jump into Super 35 and giving you that 135 millimeter angle of view, uh, it's gonna frame up your subject even tighter which obviously can have some value as well at the end of the day i think that this is a great addition to the series because it gives you some options and options like we haven't really seen before in very compact lenses on sony i'm dustin abbott and if you look in the description down below you can find linkage to my full text review also to the image gallery i encourage you to check out that and beyond that of course there are buying links there if you'd like to purchase one for yourself beyond that there is linkage to follow me on social media or to follow craig to become a patron to sign up for my newsletter uh, purchase some of my merchandise of course if you haven't already please click that subscribe button right here on youtube ring that bell so you get notification when new content drops thanks for watching have a great day and let the light in.